Uh, just to give you all some background who's coming in, this is our program for the Bell Weather Festival in Bellevue that happened uh, last summer. And we had a lot of great performances. Welcome, David. Hi. We have so many guests. Welcome. Thank you for taking time out of your schedule to join us today. Thank you all for joining, especially um, on such a short notice and busy schedule of time zone differences. Thank you for joining us. Welcome, Brooke. Welcome, Brooke. Welcome, Brooke. everyone welcome to this hub the first cultural create community event of the year i'm rainy i'm the consensus organizer of this hub welcome yan fong thank you rainy thank you okay oh so we have another minute to let more people join us and then we will start. Welcome, Thomas. Welcome, David. Welcome, Angela. Welcome. Hello, Michael. Hi. Welcome, Yunji. How are you doing today? Welcome, Ling. Thank you for joining us. Okay. We have so many friends, old friends and new friends. Thank you. Thank you for taking your time from very from your very busy schedule to join us today. Okay. Okay, good evening, everyone. Welcome and thank you for attending today's event, which is a part of our ongoing free virtual event series, Culture Create Community. Today's topic will focus on preserving and promotion culture from an East Asian perspective. The work that we are doing at East Hub is relevant to the continued growth and the development of the East Side and beyond. My name is Ruan Zhu. You can call me Rainy, and I work at East Hub as a consensus organizer focused on community engagement and outreach. And today I have my team, my supervisor, uh, all with me to help uh, assist with the, uh, our program and uh, to run our pools. They are Sudeshna, Nona, Bernardo, Vanya. Welcome. Thank you, my team. And today's meeting is centered around Asians' voice, voices and uh, experiences. But we are welcome, uh, you are wel we welcome participation from everyone. Please say hello in your native language. 
and show how you greet people. You are, uh, yeah, please feel free to use the chat function or raise your hand. You are welcome to unmute yourself to speak directly. Thank you. Ni hao. Ni hao. Ni hao. Ni hao. Ni hao. Ni hao. Hello. Ni hao. Hello. Oh. Need a hao. Wan shang hao. Namaste. Mm -hmm. Lego. Uh, how to. Buyang, could you show us how to speak in Korean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 晚上好. Mm -hmm. Hello. Hello. Satrikal. Satrikal. Oh, Satrikal. Hola. 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 That's cute. Yeah. Jumbo. See Jumbo. Dobro došli. Roseanne, you'll have to repeat that. Yeah. It's really great to hear all of different language. Oh, Michael says, what's up? What's up? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, thank you for that. And if you belong to any organization or, or if you are an artist yourself, please uh, put that in the chat. We would love to hear from where you are. Yeah. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for being, us, being with us today. Okay. See Jumbo. Hi, Baiti. See Jumbo. 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 Karabuni. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you, all of you. And before we introduce you to uh, those distinguished guest speakers today, let me quick go through today's uh, agenda. Okay. First, we will hear a few words from our founder and CEO, Ray Collum. Second, we will have a three part program. Part one, pin and gain. Part two, barriers and ladders. And part three, inherit and carry forward. Each part, we will have two to three guest speakers and uh, will be followed by a Q&A session. Our goal is to share, but also to listen to your stories, to explore how we preserve, present, and promote our heritage culture and facilitate more art and cultural opportunities and experiences on its side. Now I have the honor to intro of introducing Ray Collum, the, the CEO of East Hub, to kick our event off by an introduction about East Hub. Welcome, Ray. Thank you, Rainy. Uh, good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for uh, coming out for these, this event, which uh, these events are just getting more and more interesting and exciting each time we have them. Uh, I want to start by acknowledging that um, East Hub knows that we live and we work on the unceded traditional land of the Coast Salish uh, peoples. That includes, but is not limited to, the Snoqualmie, uh, Suquamish, Duwamish, Nisqually, Tulalip, and Muckleshoot tribes. Uh, we appreciate and we honor the original residents of this land, and we stand in solidarity with them against longstanding inequities and systematic oppression. We are committed to building enduring relationships and striving together to achieve just, equitable, and impactful change, um, starting with events uh, just like this one. Um, again, thank you for attending tonight. Uh, I have 30 seconds, says Sudeshna, to tell you a little bit about uh, East Hub because it's such a packed evening. Um, East Hub is a community development organization. Although we work in the arts and culture field, we're not an arts organization. We don't produce theater or dance or paint pictures. Uh, what we do is work to develop uh, cross-cultural gathering spaces and embed them uh, in the fabric of the East Side community. And by these, I mean spaces that range from community level spaces like dance studios and artist studios and exhib small exhibition spaces, all the way up to fully finished professional level uh, performance and gathering spaces. Um, 
East Hub saw uh, a, a need out in the community. Uh, the rapid pace of development has uh, uh, had the effect of erasing a, a lot of the cultural gathering places that we used to have. Um, and if we don't stop right now and purposely uh, it, try with great intention to make sure that we build a cultural heart and soul into the East Side community, this wave of development will pass us by and we'll be left with a pretty sterile place. Uh, unlike most arts and culture organizations that I've worked with when I've worked on other buildings and other organizations, we are not dictating to the community what it is we're giving them uh, and trying to get support for it. We're beginning with conversations with the community like this um, to figure out exactly what it is the community needs and uh, figure out how to work together, activating all sectors of the Eastside Society, by that I mean government, uh, corporations, philanthropists, the very uh, diverse, brilliantly diverse arts and cultural groups that live here and the population in general to do something collectively that no sector has the power to do uh, on its own. A um, uh, couple other things we're working on, a cultural matching, mapping project for the east side that's going to let us know where resources are and more importantly where voids exist so that we can work collectively with the community to figure out how to fill them. Uh, and eventually we're going to develop uh, a thriving shared service model for all the arts and culture groups to uh, take advantage of, uh, to fill in their own uh, personal organizational holes, uh, to spend less money on, on the boring stuff of the business, raising money in accounting and graphic design, and more money and resources on engaging their community uh, and pursuing their mission. Uh, that's East Hub. Uh, thank you again for coming. Rainy, back to you. Okay, thank you, Ray. Thank you so much. Although East Hub's work is focused on the East Side and the Renton uh, area, we seek input and participation from the East Side and the beyond. And of course, every person tune in to this Zoom call. And I have a special guest from City of Belleville. It's Brooke Broad. And Brooke is the uh, community, de uh, de community department of City of Belleville. She is the community engagement lead. Uh, I'm not sure whether, uh, Brooke, would you like to say hello to our? I'll just say hello. And, and I'm really here to, uh, as an opportunity to listen and learn from the community. So I'm excited to just um, be, so sometimes I'm always a facilitator. So now I'm very excited to be a participant and have this opportunity to hear the stories from people in the community. So thank you, Rainy, for the thank introduction. You. Thank you, Brooke, thank you. Okay, uh, okay, everyone. Uh, welcome to our first part, Paint and Again. We all know the process of an artist pursuing art wholeheartedly is difficult, especially under the influence of the pandemic and other adverse social factors is more difficult. Before we get started on our speeches, I would like to share a resilience story from a famous local artist, Mr. Deng. Mr. Deng is a well-known Chinese artist in Washington state whose artwork has been on display in local museums. He created the signs to welcome China, China President Hu Jintao in 2006. But Mr. Deng's gallery has been ruined. This is what's left after a fire ripped through Zhuali Deng's art studio in Seattle's Chinatown International District last month what wasn't ruined was stolen after people broke in three times. Art supplies, precious stones used to make seal engravings, and award-winning paintings all gone. Oh, over a hundred of his painting is missing. Deng is a well-known Chinese artist and calligrapher in the city whose artwork is seen all over the CID. His paintings have been on display in local museums and other places across the country. Okay, in college, college, uh, college universities, universities, universities yeah. in the United States, they also collect his painting. Yes. His artistry on display during Lunar New Year in 2019 when he designed Golden Pearl, the sister to Pike Place Market's famous pig. Deng's art studio has been a beloved place in the community for more than 20 years. 
It was a really special space. Visitors like Natalie Gray would stop by, drawn in by his artwork. I would make, always make a point of visiting Mr. Dang's studio whenever friends and family ate at Jade Garden across the street. We would marvel at his display of fist-sized brushes and the detail and care of his masterpieces. The impact of this artist stretching to the younger generation who learned from him how to paint, gaining an appreciation of Chinese art and culture. Many of us have sent our children, including myself, to study from Dang. That's why this fire is such a heartbreaking loss to those who know him. But Deng says he's hopeful, determined to rebuild. The community has rallied around this art studio and through a GoFundMe, they've raised more than $9,000. Okay, thank you. Thank you, for Bernardo, for the video. And we have the honor to interview Mr. Mentioned in King County, named after him. Yeah. That wasn't in your story there, but so he's a pretty important artist. Yeah. Okay, and we had the honor to interview Mr. Deng and ask about his current situation. He also has a special greeting to our guest and the audience today. Okay. Oh. Uh Uh 反正就是要共度难关 Okay, we thank Mr. Deng for sharing his amazing talent and the resilience. Now we move to our pool time. Sudeshna, is it okay to set the flash post right uh, now? Sure, yeah, let me launch it. So the question is, what would you like to see more of on the east side? And the choices are uh, multicultural arts and cultural programming, native slash indigenous arts and cultural programming, outdoor slash wilderness connected arts and cultural programming, social development related arts and cultural programming, live events, festivals, fairs, and multi-day events. And the last one is neighborhood focused arts and culture programming. It's really tough to make just one choice, but uh, we just want to see what people want to go with overall. I don't think the survey is showing, is it? Uh, it's I not. It's not. It's not. I I see the survey, but I don't know how to select something. That's because you are co-host, Eileen. I, I was able to submit the selection. Yeah, so people who are co-hosts cannot see the sur cannot submit the survey, but others can. So we have about 16 out of 29 people. Uh, 29, that seems less. Um, so we have about 55% participation and I will end the survey in about 30 seconds. If you haven't had a chance to think about it, please do so now. 
Okay, ending in five seconds. All right, I'm closing the survey. And here are the results. So looks like most people are interested in looking at uh, multicultural arts and cultural programming. And I will share the survey in a follow-up email with everybody so everyone knows what the, how people responded. Over okay. to you, Rainy. Thank you, thank you, Sveshna. Okay, all right. I'd like to welcome and introduce our first guest speakers today, Eileen Yamada Lampfair. Eileen is a retail educator and the current president of uh, Puyallup Wiley, Japanese Japanese American Citizen League. She is a well-known and respected thought leader of the Japanese American community. We may get instead from about the effect of the dark days of internment and how the Japanese community today expresses thought and voices through art and culture. I'm about to hand over to Eileen. Welcome. Great. Thank you. All right. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. All right. Thank you so very much, Ron, for that uh, wonderful um, introduction. Uh, I am honored that uh, Eastside Hub has invited me to, to share a little bit uh, of, of art and culture uh, during wartime. This is a picture that was actually painted by a local artist. He is in uh, Edmonds, Washington. His name is uh, Chris Hopkins. And the gentleman that's in the forefront is his father-in-law, Daiki Tommy. And if you are familiar with the South Sound, you will recognize this as the Puyallup Fairgrounds. It is now called the Washington State Fairgrounds in, in Puyallup. So I titled this um, Culture from Behind Barbed Wire, uh, an artistic long longing to express the human condition. Uh, Mr. Dung's uh, video and speech uh, previous to this, it was a great segue because you can see in his um, speech, in his eyes, he is willing, he is ready to get back to work. He is ready to, to get that gallery rebuilt so he can begin to, um, to share his, his art. And I think that is something that uh, I hope he is able to do very, very soon. So, oops, let me go back one. Um, so again, in our previous introduction, um, I'm doing it tag team with Cal Cam, and we are both connected to the Japanese American Citizens League. Cal was a, a previous president of Spokane, and I am the current president of Puyallup. So after uh, the bombing of Pearl Harbor, which most of you know about on December 7th, 1941, Executive Order 9066 was, was signed by then President Roosevelt, and it removed all people of Japanese descent from the West Coast, including Alaska. A lot of times we forget about uh, Alaska. And, uh, and you can see there were civilian orders that told them where they were to um, report. They had to get, they're not, they had to turn in their names and be given a family number. They were always under armed guard, even this little guy. Families had to find their way to the assembly point, the day and the time, or they were placed in the backs of military trucks. And for Japanese, they would walk rather than to have the military come and escort them because that would th that would show that they were disobeying and culturally they could not do that they could only take what what they could what could, could carry 
And, you know, back in 1942, not too many people had matching Samsonite luggage. So oftentimes they would pile up whatever they needed or could carry into bed sheets, and then they would just fo uh, fold the four corners. Um, they were forced to endure the most inhumane, disrespectful treatment. There was, there was no privacy, even for the most basic human needs. Um, and this is, these are sketches from Cho Shimizu, who was um, incarcerated on the Puyallup Fairgrounds. And he remembers and he talked to family members about what were these community latrines like? What were these community showers like? And he was able to, to give us some sketches. So you can see in, in the lavatories, people were forced to sit side by side, back, by, back to back, no partitions. And water was dumped periodically from one end to the other. Uh, hopefully you were not standing on the outside when that happened. Um, spigots for your shower just ran uh, from, from one end uh, of the wall to the other. There was no temperature or pressure controls. Uh, so if you got one of the first ones in, you could get burned because the water was really hot. And of course, if you were one of the last ones, then uh, it was gonna be cold. But, you know, there's that, there's that human spirit that says, even though, they could not speak out because they were afraid that even harsher treatment um, might come their way. They needed to express themselves. They needed to communicate with the outside, amongst themselves, and many times just for self-expression. So they used whatever they could find, the, the back of a, a cardboard box, they used um, vegetable dye, you know, they just, you know, mashed berries, whatever they could, the, the drawing and or the uh, artwork in the middle, the lady, uh, this is Heart Mountain, and she just used scraps of fabric and, and made a quilt. Um, again, scrap wood. Some of it was for necessities. Um, there were no closets, there were no benches or tables or chest of drawers. So they had to do what they could. And of course, as an artist, not only do you do the necessities, but you have to do it with flair if you can to be able to brighten your world a little bit more. So a lot of creative ingenuity. You have to remember that these were adults, meant most of them, who all of a sudden, for the first time in their lives, they did not have to work. Mom or grandma didn't even have to cook or do the dishes. So there was a lot of spare time. I want to use that in, you know, uh, sparingly, but they were able to tap into some creative, artistic, things that they may have been exposed to. Look at this steam engine, it actually works, but it was made out of tin cans and, and old watch parts, paper clips. Uh, the dolls on the, on the right were from scrap fabric. Oh my gosh, that's almost like museum quality. And they just learned how to melt down scraps of, uh, of nails and things that uh, were no longer useful in their original state. They, uh, they also did music. You know, we as you people especially know that music is a universal language. Even if you don't understand the words, there, you just find yourself humming to it, right? And same with dance. Everybody, you know, you hear a catchy tune, even if it's not your uh, culture or your native um, dance, Pretty soon it's toe tapping or it's singing and swaying and, and they kept that up in, in the camps. There was also an opportunity to do some writing, especially when the government and the military realized that uh, just because people wanted to write, it wasn't because they were trying to overturn or to uh, rebel in any way. Um, so there was uh, opportunities for them to send letters, to people outside, they started their own camp newspapers, uh, some poetry, short stories. 
um, that's all that artistic uh, desire to, to express themselves. And then of course, the most common cultural connection and that's sports. You know, even if you're, um, you're not a good player, uh, even if you're the best player, you know, you provide entertainment for, for the audience. Um, and then sometimes art is an obligation. Um, this was actually at a funeral and you look real closely and you think, wow, how did they find all these wonderful flowers in, in the desert? Well, they didn't. Those are all origami flowers. They found every little, and when someone passed away, they found paper, newspaper, whatever they can find and they made origami flowers so that um, they can show their respects with these, with these floral um, wreaths. So even in the most traumatizing times of our lives, and so many of our more recent immigrants and refugees, they, I think, hold this dearly, is that the arts call to them to express themselves, share their experience, and the lack of material is not going to stop them. Even if it's do a drawing or a poem in the sand and, and the water comes in and erases it. Um, because of these pieces of art, future generations now have an avenue to connect with people in history. And I've always thought that artists have the last word in history. So for artists work to be understood, Common modes of communication is required, and thus we have to have a need for language. So I'm going to turn this over to Cal Cam, and he is going to um, talk to us about um, Star Talk. Thank you, Amy. Thank you. Thank you so much for letting us know about the history, and I can feel the historic weight behind your words and the pictures. And uh, now it's my honor to introduce Mr. Kelvin Kam. He is a retired educator, past president of the Spoken uh, Japanese American Community League, and uh, currently working with the StarTalk at the City University. As a very respected educa education expert, Kel, Kel's student, including me and some of uh, our listeners today have been benefited greatly from his teaching and guidance. Today, Mr. Kemp's presentation title is Rebirth of a Lost Language, Why Post-War Children Do Not Speak Their Native Language. Welcome, Mr. Kemp. Thank you, Run. I'm just setting up for my PowerPoint here. Uh, this was okay. as uh, hold on. as Eileen mentioned that we're kind of doing a tag team uh, on this right here and that is uh, I'm going to talk about start mainly about Star Talk, and I did not know that Betty, that you were going to be in the audience today. Betty Lau is the director of uh, the City U Star Talk program. So why now I have to tell tell you all the truth because I can't lie because she's here. Ah. <laughs> but but to start this off, you know, there's a saying goes that both language and arts have the function to give expression to our experiences. And that is in the experience of arts in the music and uh, in education as well. And one of the things Elaine, uh, Eileen talked about uh, times during the war. So I'm going to talk about times after the war, after World War II. Um, People who are immigrating to the uh, U.S. who are first generation from other countries such as China or Japan, the Asian countries, are shocked that we third generation uh, Asians in the United States do not speak uh, Chinese or Japanese or, or uh, Filipino or any of these languages. And that is because 
it was really not a popular time in the United States history to be Asian after World War I. And what our parents wanted us to do is they wanted us to speak English with an American accent. They did not want us to speak with any type of Asian, either be Chinese, Japanese, or, or uh, Filipino, or what have you, uh, accents. And so we were, we were not forbidden to speak it, but we were not encouraged, or nor were we taught uh, our uh, heritage language. And I'm from originally from Hawaii. And so if you go to Hawaii, any third generation Asian in uh, uh, Hawaii probably does not speak their heritage language. So with that in mind, uh, with that background to start off, there is a program, it's called Star Talk, and it is really in all the states. It is a program that is a federal grant funded by the National Security Agency and Administration. Uh, and it is in the National Foreign Language Center at the University of Maryland is the one who is really coordinating all these grants from all the states. The goal of this program is to increase the number of students enrolled in the studies of critical language. That's number one. Number two is to increase the number of highly effective critical language teachers in the United States. And thirdly, it is to increase the number of highly effective materials and curriculum available to teachers and students in the critical need language. So of course, now your first question is, what are these critical languages? Well, these are the eight, eight critical languages uh, targeted by the StarTalk uh, grants. But in the state of Washington, only these languages that is highlighted in red are, uh, are in a StarTalk program. Now, CityU is not the only university who has them. There are two other universities uh, that have a Star Talk program in the state of Washington. Okay. One is the University of Washington, one is City University, and the other one is a, is a partnership of Seattle School District and PLU, Pacific Lutheran University. The Star Talk program itself has three uh, have three. I guess you could call them focuses, is that what it can either be a student program is your focus, you're focusing on students. It can be a teacher program where you're trying to uh, uh, increase the uh, number of certified teachers in these critical languages. Or it can be in a practicum form like a lab school or stu in, uh, in a student, uh, Certific our teacher certification, they all have to go through student teaching. So I'm not, I am not part of University of Washington, but you can go on their website and in that little question or search uh, block, just type in Star Talk and their program will pop up. And they focus on the language of Russian. And they have a program that is called Russia in the Skies and Outer Space. And it is the target audience are high school students. And they have uh, another program called Heritage Language Symposiums. And their target, target audience are teachers. And there's a lot of information in there about their program if you want to, uh, excuse me, if you want to learn to see what it's about. Now, City University, and PLU have teacher programs, or that is t uh, teacher programs. City U of the two is the only one that takes a we goal. Lost, of, we lost yeah. your audio, sorry. Can you start with City U, please? Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, City U is the only, um, uh, city, between City U and PLU, uh, City U takes to, uh, participants from the very beginning to the end of their certification. 
PLU is the goal is to uh, uh, do that, and they're almost completed in the process. But currently, they are they supplement their ed department uh, with courses uh, for certification. And then, of course, in the practicum area. Uh, I just mentioned that earlier is that uh, lab schools, both City U and PLU run lab schools in the summer uh, where they bring in uh, students from the community and have their language teachers teach these students in their native language. It's, it's normally, it's a, um, a um, immersion program that is run in these lab schools. And of course, in student teaching, it's traditional student teaching, what every, you know, what, what every other university does. So now I'll just talk about the city youth since I'm the most familiar with it. It started in uh, 2005, and currently uh, we have graduated over 100 teachers uh, with, their certificate, uh, with their certificates. Now, our participants of this program go through the, our program in what we call cohort models. In other words, 19 participants are usually in a cohort and they follow each other through, uh, through the program. It is in what is called an alt route to certification. And for those of you who are not familiar with what that means, is that in order to get into the, uh, to the program, they have to have a pre, uh, their BA degree. So we do not get them their bachelor's degree. They have to come to us with their bachelor's degree. But they have certain skills such as language, such as uh, uh, that's what we focus on is the language part, Chinese, Korean, um, uh, Hindi. And then we also had Arabic, uh, Arabic. They are the four languages. We don't run them every year, but Chinese has always run and Korean is our largest, Chinese and Korean are two of our larger population of students. The, it is a four quarter program, so they can get their teacher certificate in uh, basically in one year. The, um, uh, the program that is the program is designed to be a fast track to giving somebody their teacher certification. So their classes are uh, the courses that they take are not like what a four year student would take. It's very abbreviated. It's very uh, there are fewer courses that they have to take to complete the program. And. Uh, and that is pretty much it. We are, we are trying to get back language back into uh, the United States. So, uh, because one of the things, one of the uncomplimentary things that we are known for is we are a monolingual country. People in the United States normally do not speak more than one language, which is English. And so we are trying to get away from that. So now I'm going to turn it back to, there's supposed to be a question and answer session after that. And whoever is moder moderating that, uh, I will stop sharing and turn the screen back over to you. Thank you, Carol. That would be me. Um, I would encourage participants to post their questions in the chat. Um, and in the interest of time, um, if you think of something now, uh, sorry, if you cannot think of something now, we can revisit it later. Um, I think all our guest uh, speakers are going to stay till the end of the program. I did have one question for Eileen, which you can um, address in the chat itself, and then we can move on. Um, if you want to learn more about this history or this topic, what are some good resources uh, that can get us started? Um, so maybe Eileen, you can post it in the chat. And if you all think of any questions, uh, I'll make sure that we address them at the end of the session. Um, Rainy, over to you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Carl. Thank you, Stashna. I think after Carl's presentation, deeper understanding about why language is an important carrier of culture. And uh, language is both barrier and the lighter. I think so. Uh, let's move to our part two, barriers and lighters. It's my pleasure to introduce 
Miss Dong Mei Tan, the vice principal of Jingmei Elementary School of the uh, Bellevue School District. I'm very uh particular. I'm very grateful to Miss Tan for taking time to participate in our event from her very busy schedule. Um, well, welcome, Miss Tan, and thank you for being with us today. Ms. Tan is going to talk about Mandarin dual language program and culture in East Side area. Welcome. Thank you, Rain. Um, do you want me to share the PowerPoints? Okay. I can share if you want, yeah. Okay. My name is Dong Mei, good evening, and I'm the current assistant principal at Jinmei Elementary. Um, it's my honor to present tonight to uh, share a little bit about myself and our program at Jinmei. I uh, grew up in China, southern part of China, Guangdong, Taishan, and uh, speaking um, with multiple dialects and uh, in Chinese language is always part of my life. And now I'm a, a mom of two girls and um, soon I will have my third child. So as a parent and also an educator, um, preserving my culture and heritage is part of my, um, my mission for myself and also my passion. So in the next uh, few minutes, I'm going to quickly talk about uh, what we are doing at uh, Jinmei as a program um, and how are we supporting our students and our staff and community to continue to embrace and uh, promote Asian culture. You can go to the next slide, please. So at Jinmei Elementary um, is a, a school that um, started with a program in 2011 at uh, Ardmore Elementary School. And it was about 24 students at the program in one class in kindergarten. And now we are a full program of um, more than 450 students from pre-K to fifth grade. The first cohort um, that um, they graduated from Jinmei now is at high school, yeah, at Newport High School now. And the program we are uh, doing at Jinmei is a two-way dual language immersion model program. So as you can see um, in the next slide, um, you can see the graph of um, the racial diversity at our program. And since I said the two-way immersion program is um, half of the population, um, the student population is from the um, 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 student who can already speak Chinese. And the other half of the student are from the uh, family that they do not speak the Chinese language. Um, the two-way immersion program is helping students to um, have the body language support from each other and, um, and understand different cultures in the student population. Uh, at Jinmei, we want to prepare all the students to become biliterate, bilingual, and global citizen for the 21st century. And our pathway is from pre-K-12 um, for all dual language students, including um, Mandarin. And also uh, at Bellevue, we have the Spanish, Spanish dual language program um, until high school. And at the bottom corner, you can see this is the program model. So from kindergarten to first grade, students are learning um, the language through different content um, through Chinese, 90% in Chinese time, they immerse into the Chinese language in their classroom. And then also 10%, which is about two hours each week, they learn about um, the English language development and also how to uh, engage in social emotional learning. And then when they get to second grade, they, um, we're trying to add a little bit more um, English so they can bridge into the third grade model, which is 50% English and 50% 50, 50 Chinese. And then when they get to fourth grade and fifth grade, they maintain in the 50% model. And um, students still need to take uh, their state test. And according to research and the data that we are seeing, students are learning content in Chinese, but what they are doing in the state test is really above and beyond the state um, uh, average score. 
And in the next slide, I'm going to talk about uh, what we are doing um, to support our students and staff and also families to reserve um, Asian identity and culture. And for students, um, we are following the BSD Bellevue curriculum. We are using Mandarin as a language to help them to use as a vehicle to learn about math, science, and social studies, different, uh, different area. As um, Mr. Kim, um, Kim shared that we wanted to use the language so that they feel like um, it's part of their life and they can use it in uh, when they get to the society. And also we, we are trying to uh, use thematic approach. That means when they are uh, learning something in their classroom, when they go to art, when they go to um, their PE or when they go to their library time, they have different opportunities to explore the history and also um, Chinese culture, such as calligraphy, Chinese painting, and literature. And um, we are having student leaders to lead our assembly and also use the language so that they understand the history and also the arts of our Chinese, our Chinese language. And for our staff, 90% um, of our staff um, um, Chinese or Chinese American, so we want our students to see that they have um, uh, teacher models. And also um, we are really lucky to have partnership with um, CDU, UW and Central Washington University to um, have a lot of um, um, interns to support our, our school. And also we see that as a partnership so that we can grow our um, Chinese teachers in our community and also partnering with families PDSA, um, our local communities to support families to get involved to support our program. Um, if I say it is really hard to build dual language program in um, uh, the United States is an understatement. It takes a whole village and it's a lot of barrier that we are facing such as uh, limitation of curriculum, limitation of books that we can access. Um, we, we still need a lot of um, Chinese teachers or dual language teachers that has the certification. So um, we are trying our best and um, this opportunity is, um, is, is really um, in front of us and we wanna capture that. As a school, um, we, we still wanna embrace our students' language and also culture and, and their identity starting in their really young age. But that's all for today. Um, I'm gonna thank you for your time. And um, if you have any questions, just let me know. Thank you. Thank you, Dong Mei. Thank you for letting us know how Jing Mei has made such a huge, uh, made such a huge contribution to the preservation and the promotion of Chinese culture to the community. And I'd like to express my respect to all frontline school staff for your persistence. Uh, during the pandemic. Thank you. Thank you all. Yeah, now, and Ray, and actually today we have two um, CDU interns in the uh, audience that they are currently serving at Jinmei community. So, Zhiqi and Jia Luo. Oh, Welcome, Zhiqi and Jia Luo. Thank you. Thank you all. Okay. Uh, now I'm honored to introduce another cross cultural ambassador language education expert from Korean community. Bu Yang Kim is a vice principal of United Seattle and Belleville Korean School, Belleville campus. She is also a Korean lecturer of Central Washington University. And Mr. Uh, Ms. King's presentation will be connecting with heritage through language. Welcome, Bu Yang. Hi, nice to meet you all, and thank you for inviting me today. And I'm going to present about Bellevue Korean School. The Bellevue Korean School is uh, has a two campus, and we runs only on Saturday, like a once a week. So today, I want to introduce how what is the main activity for the Bellevue Korean School and what we are doing at for Korean school and how affecting Korean society. 
our the school activities. So I want to share my slide first. So, um, Bellevue, the Bellevue Korean School is United Seattle and Bellevue Korean School, and it started since 1996, and it's a nonprofit organization, and um, many uh, small Korean schools are starting from the part of the church. So in 1996, 10 small Korean schools combined and we made a United Seattle Bellevue Korean schools. The Seattle campus located in Linwood opened first and then a Bellevue campus opened. Now there are 500 students and 40 teachers and 50 teacher assistants on the Bellevue campus. And the students are from four years old to adults and every, has, every grade has a beginning level to advanced level. So Bellevue Korean School is renting Thai middle school for like a from four, four years old to 11th grade students and the adult students are using Bellevue Community College classroom. But since uh, 2020 pandemic, all programs have been going through online. The main activities of Bellevue Korean School are teaching their Korean language and culture. And most of the students are from the Korean immigrant family from first to third generation. And most of the students and parents want to learn Korean language to communicate with their families. So personally, I immigrant after marriage and my husband is a second generation immigrant with limited Korean language and cultural knowledge. He looks fine to live in America. He has a job and he has lots of friends and it seems like no problem for a living, but he really communicate with his parents and my parents and he doesn't know like his family history very well. So whenever my husband has a conflict with uh, his parents, they try to escape each other rather than figure it out. So it's, it's tough to figure out because they don't know each other very well and they rarely communicate because of their language barrier. So after marriage, like they keep talking to me and then I should have figured out everything. So <laughs> that is the main stuff. Also, I saw outside of a home, he feels that I'm different. I'm not fully Korean. I'm not fully American. If I'm neither, I prefer to be American. Because of this, it is tough to persuade him to learn Korean. So it's not even for my husband, to my husbands, most of my students, especially teenagers, they don't want to learn Korean. They, they don't have any motivation to learn Korean. They're too busy to follow their schoolwork and school activities and, and they realize that I'm different and they still start to be confused about the identity. So they don't want to spend time or spend efforts to learning Korean language. And for them, Korean culture doesn't look that cool. So sometimes they feel like a shame for Korean culture. But little by little, there has been a change to teenagers in Korean school after BTS is getting so popular. Their friends shows interest in Korean language, Korean food, and Korean culture. So middle school and high school students number get increased and not even heritage students, but various race students start to enroll the class. And the Netflix show, Squid Game, makes Korean traditional games and snacks so popular. So in Korean school, we have a cultural day once a week, uh, once a year. And we introduce like such these games many times. And at that time, students really showed interest. But now they teach how to make the flip paper card and how to make the sugar candy to their classroom classmates. 
they all learn in Korean school and they never showed interest in it. And now they show me, can you teach me again how to make the flip paper cards and then how to make the, that sugar candy we made it before? So they felt that, oh, I can introduce something to others because I'm Korean and I know something. So that makes me very happy. And they started to learn, like a, they started to have a motivation and they started to talk with their parents and they tr started to ask, what is Korean culture? And what did you do when you were young? And they're interested in, they show to interested to their parents and their history. So Korean school, the, especially the Bellevue Korean school runs only three hours a week. It's 32 times a year. It's a, like a 32 weeks. But I hope this learning experience, it's a small learning experience about the language and culture and history. But the kids build up their identity and it makes build up their self-esteem and respect other cultures too. So that is the main thing, what we are doing now. And hopefully the more like a heritage families, not even the heritage family, all the society in East side, they are interested in other cultures and we can combine together. That is our main hope. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Buyang. Let, uh, let us know about the main role and activities of Korean schools for connecting your heritage in language. And a big thanks to United Seattle and the Belleville Korean School. Uh, Ms. Yang Ju Parker mm -hmm. helped us create the Korean version poster for this event. So many thanks. Oh, that is great. <laughs> yeah. Any questions to these two uh, principal and now is the Q&A session for part two. Welcome, Sudeshna. Yes, uh, I've been posting in the chat. If you have any questions, uh, please, please post them in the chat. Uh, if we, if you can't think of anything right now, we can have all the Q&A towards the end of the discussion. Okay, hold on. I just saw something. Yeah, I think so. How about move to the, the second post? Absolutely. Let me get on it. Uh, okay, so this is going to be a short poll because we're kind of somewhat running behind time, but I'm just going to read it out for people. Um, what are the barriers for attending cultural events on the east side? It's a single choice question, as always, because it's just extremely, if it's not a single choice, people just take everything and then we don't get a good answer. Um, so the, uh, the choices are lack of arts and cultural activities, lack of information about events, lack of events that interest me, lack of quality programming, cost of attending, I prefer to do other activities, uh, difficulty with transportation or parking at events, and lack of diversity in programming. I can see the most popular so far. Well, I shouldn't say anything right now. Okay, I would really encourage all of you to answer this poll because I'm gonna shut it in five seconds. All right. Looks like we have a very clear winner. Uh, lack of information about events is uh, something that's come up the most. And it's interesting because um, I'm just gonna plug in a little project that East Hub is working on right now with the city of Bellevue. Uh, we are actually working with them to create a uh, events calendar for all of East Side where organizations can input their arts and cultural events and it's free, it's open to all cities on the east side and it would be ultimately a wonderful resource for people to find out about events that are happening here. So thank you for sharing the poll and I will stop sharing and back to you, Rainy. Hey, thank you, thank you, Sudeshna. All right, let's go to our part three of our event today. We will talk about inherit and carry forward challenges and uh, roadblocks faced by artists, art and cultural related nonprofits, management, organizational operations, and uh, 
successful experience in overcoming this difficulty. As you all know that Leto Master Club is a very well-known nonprofit organization in the Chinese community rooted in the East Side area. Today, we are honored to have Ms. Li Chen, who is currently a board member of the Little Master Club, responsible for public relations, to talk about how the kids from Chinese community operate and participate in diversified project and preserve and promote Chinese culture in the greater Seattle area. Welcome, Li Chen. Thank you, Rini. And thank you, Ishab, for the invitation. It's our great honor to be here tonight. Uh, so before I share uh, the PowerPoint slides, let's watch a, a very short video about our Little Masters Club. Little Masters Club is an open platform which provides an encouraging environment for children to participate, enjoy, and lead diversified projects. Our projects cover community service, education support, culture exploration, and interest groups. In this video, we are going to present all our current projects and let's see if you are interested in any of them. Here we go. Uh, because our video is pretty long, it's a 10 minute one. So I just put it short in a uh, PowerPoint slides for tonight's event. Uh, as we heard on the uh, video, Little Masters Club, it's a nonprofit organization that we provide uh, and encourage children from the greater Seattle area Chinese community to serve our community by supporting them to run different uh, kind of projects. Originally, our pro first project started in 2010 uh, by the first our online English reading program together with kids from China in Jingdezhen, part of uh, uh, China, China. And uh, in Washington State, we established our organization, uh, registered registered as a nonprofit organization uh, back in 2012. So this year marks the 10th year of our organization. Our headquarter is in um, Seattle, but we also have our branch uh, uh, offices in San Francisco, in Beijing of China, and also Jingdezhen of China. So we have four branches together. So basically there are four major categories of projects that we run at our Little Masters Club. The first is cultural exploration that we encourage kids uh, to uh, promote our traditional Chinese culture. Um, and the second is community service. And then the third is uh, a lot of different kinds of extracurricular groups. Uh, after the kids finish their school, they can run these uh, little projects. And also we do education support to support uh, underdeveloped children in remote areas in China to continue study. So first of all, cultural exploration. Uh, that's a very big focus of our club, of all the projects that we run. Uh, for example, uh, key, for example, this is the Washington State Chinese competition. Uh, Little Masters Club, we used to be a co-host in the past years prior to COVID-19. And then we become the host, uh, the major organization uh, for 2020. However, because of COVID, uh, this uh, event has to be delayed. We haven't resumed it yet. But that's a very good platform for kids, not only from the Chinese community, but for all children in the Washington state, uh, from school, from any organization, from homeschool, who are interested in Chinese language learning, uh, they are all encouraged to show their talents. Uh, whether you can sing a Chinese song, read a Chinese poem, playing Chinese music, 
or any uh, Chinese Kung Fu, any of your talent related to Chinese culture, you're more than welcome to participate. So hopefully we can restart this program when the pandemic is over. And this is, uh, this is the project we done that uh, we sent our, uh, our volunteers, majorly who are high school or middle school volunteers to uh, promote uh, our traditional culture at, at uh, different holiday events, such as the Microsoft had the Chinese Spring Festival Gala every year. And we're there, we have a whole big ballroom and different, we set up different booths uh, to show the visitors how do we celebrate Chinese New Year. Like you can see um, on the top uh, picture, there's the, this parent who's, uh, who can do serving the, the sugar candy uh, and draw the Chinese patterns of the 12 uh, Lunar New Year animals. And there are uh, our high school volunteers uh, teaching the kids to make Chinese lanterns or the fireworks paper cutting or tea serving to celebrate uh, the new year. These are the type of events that we do. And also uh, at other events like the, uh, the Moon Festival or the Seattle, uh, the previously Seattle Asian uh, Festival, those kind of events, we sent our uh, youth volunteer teams to run these uh, different types of booths and to promote Chinese culture at these events. And this is another example of what we do to promote uh, the Chinese culture to the second generation of Chinese Americans grow, who, are grow, who grew up in the States. Um, still prior to COVID, uh, every summer, uh, we work with the Chinese side, the, the Chinese partners, to back these Chinese uh, American, uh, the younger generations back to different parts of China to participate in some kind of root seeking camps. It's normally one week or some uh, 10 days a week. They visit the local museums, uh, lo local uh, art uh, studios and meet with local children. And they do a lot of uh, traditional culture related activities. So the most uh, most kids who participate uh, who participated in these root seeking camps, they had a very very deep and unforgettable experience, uh, which we found it a very good connection for them to not to forget their traditional culture, not to forget where their parents come from, and and. <clears throat> Okay, that's, that's some of the projects we run under our cultural exploration projects. And also we have the art group. Our art group is also run by a group of uh, high school and middle school volunteers. They teach uh, the, the younger kids every week, every, actually every Friday evening, about one or two hour class. Uh, because of the COVID, now we are running this program online. So they can teach them a lot of arts and crafts stuff. Each week, there's a different uh, theme. Uh, but besides uh, the, the popular styles, they also teach them some Chinese traditional arts and crafts uh, Pro, uh, little items, especially during the holidays, the Chinese holidays. You can see in the middle, that's the Chinese lotus Latin or the candle holder, those type of stuff, which are very popular to the little children and their families. So besides uh, cultural pr uh, promotion, we also encourage our Chinese uh, American uh, generations to serve our community. So we run a lot of community service projects. For example, uh, we work with the King County Repair, uh, the Solid Waste Division on the uh, repair events, which were used to held uh, per month by, uh, on a monthly basis in different libraries in each city. Uh, our, as you can see from the left uh, top uh, photo, that's our high school volunteer who serve as a repair uh, uh, fixer to repair the small household items for the local residents. We also always, uh, work with Blood Work Northwest to promote blood donation outreach to the local Chinese community, especially to high, school, uh, high schools and the Chinese families. And during COVID, especially uh, um, 
at the first um, two, two and especially in the first two months during the surge of the COVID, we donated uh, PPEs and uh, lunches to local uh, hospitals and clinics. And for, uh, for our uh, extracurriculum group, uh, our uh, high school volunteers also run a lot of uh, projects like nature work to nature walk to preserve our uh, environment. We rescue the dogs, the abandoned dogs from China and bring them to the host family in, uh, here uh, in Seattle. And education support, this part also, although it's the program that our, key, our volunteers here, they went back to China every summer to run some uh, summer camp for children from rural countries or countryside parts in less developed places in China. But actually we found it a very interesting, uh, it's also another kind of cultural exchange because uh, the most popular uh, subject that our, our kids teach those Chinese students is about American culture, American history, or the, even in the arts and crafts or the STEM classes, those, uh, those ones that are related to American culture is the most popular ones because kids in China, they are not familiar with that. So they are very interested to learn about the American culture. That's in Shanxi, Qingdezhen. And that's the fundraising program. Uh, that's our online English reading. We teach those um, less developed uh, families, uh, their kids with, with English, uh, about English stories, English culture, uh, American holidays, those type of stuff. Yeah, so that's what we do. That's what we do with uh, the culture per, uh, uh, preservation and also promotion of the traditional culture. But we also, we found it very important that we, uh, we're not only uh, preserving our own culture, but we want more cultural exchange with different diversified cultures, people from different cultural background. Uh, so we can work together to make our society better. Thank you. Thank you for sharing, Li Chen. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I have another interesting fact about Li to share out with all of you is that Ms. Chen used to serve for Embassy of Canada in Beijing and uh, where part of her job involved in cooperation with nonprofit organizations all over China. So she is really an expert. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Let's move to next part. As a as a ambassador of art and cultural exchange, Mr. Fong has ignited artist careers of many people through teaching and performance. She, he is a professor of violin and the founder of orchestral instrument department of China, and he has a lot of title and but. He is unable to attend today's event due to conflict, but he recorded a video to meet us and convey his ideas about international music festival and the competition on East Side area. Okay, let's see the video. Hello everyone, I'm Yuan Fang. Thanks, Rini, for inviting me to share with you about music learning and education. The Asian community in the East Side is growing rapidly, and many children from Asian families are playing musical instruments. Classical music takes a lot of time and effort to learn. Children may spend many years achieving some progress. In addition to individual practice, they need stage performances mass classes and competitions, as well as ensemble or orchestra training to hone their skills. Today, I would like to propose a high-profile international summer music festival in the East Side to be held annually from late June to early July. The festival would consist of five parts, mass classes, music competitions, experts concerts, that is student recitals and competition award concerts. 
Professors from major conservatories and local musicians can be invited as our adjudicator and teaching experts. The festival will bring benefits to children who learn music in our community. For example, they can keep contact with famous musicians from all over the world, learning with them face to face and enjoying their live music. Children can attend multiple concerts to gain valuable stage performance experiences, improve performance skill through competitions, and receive comments from experts. This will also test what they have achieved their daily practice. In addition, such high-profile music festival and music event would have a huge influence. The competition certificate of the festival and the award certificate of the competition achieved by the students will be highly valued and recognized by the society, which will definitely contribute to students' future education and personal resume. The musical festival can also create a better cultural and artistic environment in the East Side. Finally, I would like to tell children that basic practice is extremely important, even if you are playing an instrument as a hobby. Only in this way you can master it. Even though you can decide how much time you want to spend on it, practice every day. You need to take good care of your instrument, as it is your close friend. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Okay, thanks to Mr. Fong's video. If you have any question for Mr. Fong, please leave your question and uh, contact information. We will pass it on to him after today's meeting and reply to you by email. Thank you very much for your understanding. Now, I'm honored to introduce to you uh, Michael J. Babbitt. Michael is the actual director of Mass Cultural Council and the EDI uh, consultant at East Hub. Michael and his husband adopted a child from Vietnam, and he will share a few story, a, a few stories about of how they made sure their son knew where he came from and understood his root and his culture. Welcome, Michael. Thank you so much, Rainy. Hello, ni hao, namaste, um, anyo haseyo. Satri uh, Akal, Sajimbo. Uh, my name is Michael. I'm the executive director of Mass Cultural Council, which is the state funding agency for arts and culture out in Massachusetts. So I'm coming from you from the opposite side of the country. Uh, I'm so honored to be here and so really impressed by the rich cultural scene you have, especially part of coming from the Asian community in, in the East Side. Um, as Rainy mentioned, yes, my husband um, and I adopted a baby from Vietnam. I have some pictures because I'm a dad, so I like to show my pictures. Um, hopefully you can see this. That's him there. That's the day we met at his orphanage in Vietnam. His name is Sang. And now he is studying marine biology at the University of Florida, and he turns 21 this year. So he's just been the best thing I've ever um, accomplished. Uh, he's just this amazing kid. And it was important to me um, as a black man uh, to really infuse him with everything I could about his culture. So he studied Vietnam, Vietnamese. He, we celebrate the um, Vietnamese holidays, the Harvest Moon Festival and upcoming soon is Tet. Anyone celebrating Tet, I like to say Chuk Mong Nam Moi. It was so important to us that we actually don't send out Christmas cards. We send out New Year's cards. So that's going in the mail next week um, to all of our friends and family. Uh, my husband is Jewish. And so we have a multicultural family. And one of the things that is important to us is that we celebrate each other's cultures. Uh, his favorite thing was the Chinese parade. And he wanted to be a professional lion dancer when he was a kid. We always had um, uh, books about his culture on his bookshelves. Um, and he grew up um, wanting to study more. And actually, he got deeply entrenched into Japanese culture. 
Uh, and after he went to an exchange program in Tokyo, he did not want to move back to the US because he thinks Tokyo is the greatest city in the world. Uh, and my husband also worked um, in Asia in, in many places and lived in Hong Kong and Tokyo and Nepal and Vietnam. So we like to celebrate the Asian culture as much as we can. I'm impressed by what you're doing and I'm hoping when I get a chance to come out there to visit, I can meet some of you in person, but thank you so much for being here. Thank you for letting me share my family story with you. And uh, for those of you celebrating New Year's, Happy New Year. Uh, and I'll just say ciao. Thank you so much. Thank you, Michael. Thank you for sharing with us such a sweet story about your family. And in the terms, uh, interest of time, we are going to wrap up now. It's well known that Lunar New Year is celebrated by many Asian community and uh, uh, for good fortune, health, and a time of reunion, reunite. This year marks the transition to the year of tiger. And uh, usually the Lunar New Year festival period lasts for, for 50 days, starting from Lunar New Year Eve to the Lantern Festival. And we have a list of resources for the celebration of about Lunar New Year to share with you. And let's end today's event by wishing you Happy Lunar New Year to all and uh, all our listeners and our speakers. Hope the year of tiger will run more smoothly than the year of the ox in 2021. We do and have five minutes for Q&A. Um, I know some people have questions. Uh, some of you have put them in the chat, but, uh, and you're welcome to stay longer. Uh, even if this runs out, we're done with the programming, but uh, I'm sure there are some questions from the audience. Okay. Okay. It's time to- You are welcome to, to speak or use the chat function, whichever works for you. Yeah. It's a very quiet crowd today. Hi, uh, well, uh, maybe I'll get it started. Yes, um, thank you. <laughs> oh, you're on mute. Oh, thank you. Uh, so this is Yang Feng. Uh, I'm a faculty member in School of Medicine at the University of Washington. And uh, in my spare time, I also work on the East and West Alliance and then uh, establishing a non-profit organization um, actually, it's called the East West Alliance for Education and Health. So we ran uh, the maternal uh, and uh, child health programs uh, in China. And uh, currently, are, we are also working on donating Asian books um, in English to the community. So in last year, we piloted around uh, 10 schools. And this year, we're also expanding um, the donation. So we will just uh, want to announce the program here. And uh, if there is uh, any other organizations or individuals who would like to participate to be part of the program, and then uh, we are more than happy to collaborate. Great, thank you. Could you mind, do you mind posting uh, any links in the chat if you have any? Yes, well done. Okay, great. That would be great. And I did post the links to uh, the Lunar New Year celebrations in the chat as well, if anybody wants to access that that way. Um, I, I, oh, go ahead, Nona. No, I was just going to say I had asked Eileen a question in the chat and she had shared the answer in the chat. But my question for her was, uh, where could we see all these images that she and you know art from the camps and she had posted uh, or if she would like to tell us uh, i think uh, that would be great so um tell nona there's a small oh you're on mute you're on mute eileen it's uh if you go to the it keeps unmuting, muting me. Okay. Um, the Japanese Cultural Community Center, it's at, I believe it's 1414 South uh, 
Willow Street. So it's just right off of Rainier. And they do have a small permanent exhibit of some of that artwork that I, I showed you on my slides. Uh, and, and then the executive director, Karen Yoshitomi, is very well versed also in, in art. On the east side about, oh gee, maybe five, six years ago, the Bellevue Arts Museum had a wonderful exhibit uh, uh, about uh, art from the camp. Uh, and I don't, I know it was a traveling exhibit. I don't know if that's coming back, but again, that had a wide array of, of artwork. Awesome, thank you. And I will make sure that I share any of the links in the chat uh, in a, in a follow-up email. So you had mentioned some books and some other things. Yes. I'll make sure I'll share that with the rest of the group. Thank you very much. Um, I actually had a question for Lee. Um, my kids used to go to IAWW, which is the Indian Association of Western Washington. But are there any programs that you, you had mentioned you would like to collaborate more with other groups? Uh, are there any programs that you're actively doing with other groups? Uh yeah, that's a uh, uh, currently Little Masters Club. We majorly serve the local Chinese communities in the greater Seattle area, but it's our good wish that we would like to work more with other cultural groups and together either mm -hmm. to promote our traditional culture or to participate in any cultural events or to run any um, community service projects together. I think there'll be a lot of fun. Um, if we can do it together, for example, like say the King County Repair events and the blood uh, blood uh, donation uh, outreach events, though that's something we try to uh, jump outside of the Chinese community circle to do more. So that's we will welcome any idea and suggestions if we can work together. Okay. To run any kind of projects, and that is exactly what we are trying to do at East Hub to kind of promote these cross-cultural conversations and, you know, enable them. So we do have connections with some other groups in the area, and we would love to just take you up on that and introduce you to other people and see where that takes us. Um, I have a question. This is Roseanne Royer. Can you hear go me? Ahead. Yeah, go ahead, Roseanne. Yes, I'm interested in, uh, as Little Masters Club, as an example, uh, how do you relate to the contemporary Chinese cultures in China today? Um, do you sense that they look favorably on the kinds of activities that you're doing? Do you have any connection at all with the uh, with that country <laughs> uh, of your origins? Excuse me, let me get your question correctly. Do you mean, do we have any... Um, any connection to contemporary Chinese culture rather than the traditional, the culture. Do you uh, mean that, that? That's part of it, you know, making the, the young people aware that, that culture isn't static, you know, that and language isn't either, and it moves on and changes. But it's also, uh, do you have any sense of how, do, do, the, do the, say the government of, 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 of China uh, appreciate what it is that you're doing? Yep. <laughs> okay, yeah. First of all, I would like to say that uh, the local Chinese community here, I would say they preserve more of the traditional Chinese culture, even more than people living in China right now. Because <laughs> my family, we moved to the States in 2016. Before that, I live in Beijing. Um, we don't do like say, making those Chinese lanterns or do those paper carting. Uh, but more, we celebrate Christmas. We celebrate Valentine's Day in Beijing. <laughs> but when after I moved to here to the States in 2016, I found the local Chinese community, they are more, um, uh, they're more, they're more like to uh, remember and uh, especially they want their kids to remember the root where they come from and feel proud of our traditional culture and to, to merge it into where the place where we are living and make our place a diversified, culturally diversified place. So people have different background, different culture. We, we can enjoy from each other's cultural background rather than we, we do not feel shame of our traditional culture. We feel proud of it. So that's what, what we found here and we try to 
uh, uh, let our kids, especially the second generation of Chinese Americans to do. Um, but when, when we were uh, running our projects, uh, just as I mentioned in our point, point just now, we also running projects in China, to, especially education support for those uh, children from the less developed families in China. And for that part, I would say um, we would try to uh, avoid any sensitive topics, right. as you know, because the, because of the um, different systems in, in China. So if we, uh, especially for non, uh, non-profit organizations, we try to focus on the cultural side, the social side, the kids education part. That's what we want uh, because we are a non-profit organization and we, should, we focus on children uh, to encourage children to serve the community. So we focus more on cultural uh, um, uh, social uh, issues and educations, try to avoid some sensitive topics so we can run those projects smoothly. Thank you very much. Thank you, very interesting. <laughs> Thank you. Looks yeah. like we are out of time. So I'm going to ask Rainy to wrap up and I would like to say thank you everyone for joining. Okay, thank you. Thank you all for attending and participating in today's event and your insight and the input are very valuable to us. We would like to continue engaging with all of you for our every step in the, our journey as we transform the insight into a more inclusive and vibrant cultural destination. We would like to thank Facebook for their sponsorship of our Cultural Create Community event series and Microsoft for their valuable foundational support. Also, many thanks to today's event sponsors, Mandarin Playground and the Seattle Shaolin Kung Fu Academy. Please look out for their coupons in a fellow email. And please subscribe to our newsletter for updates on future events. On behalf of everyone at East Hub, thank you for attending. Wish everyone a good night and a happy Lunar New Year. Xin Yan Hao. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good night. Good night.